In this video, I'd like to look at analyzing some mass oscillating on a spring data that I have in an Excel spreadsheet, and I'm going to do that analysis in Wolfram Cloud or Mathematica. So when you're bringing data over, you want to, I have, uh, just let's have a quick peek at the Excel. It has two, uh, two springs. And it also has some uh, multiple line headers here. Okay. So I'm going to want to, when I get to plotting and fitting, I'm going to isolate the individual springs and cut out these headers, which will interfere with the fits. So I need to do some slicing and dicing of the data that comes over. And there, one can sort of, sort of do that slicing and dicing uh, in the import to just bring over the rows and columns that you want for for spring one and then spring two, or you can sort of bring it all over and then um, slice and dice uh, once it's brought over. And uh, in this case, I've done the latter. I'm just bringing it all over and then I'll deal with uh, breaking it down after I've gotten it over into uh, my notebook here. So I just do a simple import and name it, name the data as spring. So here's the data brought over and that same Excel, spree that Excel spreadsheet that I showed you is on this, uh, you at this URL. Okay, so here is that first row. It's labels, there was a mass of 250, and then there's an empty column. And then there was a mass of 450. And then we're saying that uh, the columns are times and position, and then there's an empty column, and then there's another time column and another position column. Okay, so this is all the data that comes in. I just want to show in general sort of how to access some piece of data. So Excel has sheets. So even though there was only one sheet, we are recognizing that there could be multiple sheets. And so there is, my understanding, an index that is corresponding to what uh, sheet we are working with um, or what what came over from the sheets so in our in our list of lists and so that is this first uh one here and then uh each sheet has a sort of uh, like a two-dimensional array or list and this is sort of a row and a column so i'm on uh the, the first sheet which is all there was and uh, row five, column two, and I'm getting a seven to eight here. And so here was uh, row one was this label, row two was another label, uh, three was the time zero, four was a time oh one, and five was 0 0.02. And the position, the second column, the position for the first spring at a time of 0 0.02. So this was row five, column two is the 728. So there it is. So that's just a way to understand this, how we are getting pieces of this sort of list of lists that we that we got in from reading, importing the Excel. Okay. Now, what I want is the data corresponding to spring one. So again, it was on the first sheet. It was its row and then column. And I want all the rows from three on. So I want to start at three and then semicolon, semicolon gives me a range. And if I just want to go to the end of Waller's data, I can say minus one. So I don't have to sort of count up and know how many rows there, there are of data. So just, a, just some a sort of assuming I don't know um, all that. I haven't looked at the Excel. I don't know oh, I do look at the Excel, but I, I haven't sort of memorized all the features of the Excel. I don't need to know how many rows of data there are. And it could be different. Um, Okay, 
from you know situation to situation. So, um, so that was the rows. I went from I had two header two header rows. So I went from three on, and then for for spring number one, I wanted the first and second column. This was the time. This was the position. So that gave me the time position uh, tuples uh, and a set of them. And so then I am uh, list plotting that. So um, I'm list plotting the data. So I separated, I brought in all the data. I called it spring. I separated out the spring one data from the overall spring. And I am plotting it and I gave it a title. And I called it my data. I'm going to combine the data with a fit. And I, I, so I want to give a name to the plot of the data. So I called it uh, my data. It's really, it's not just the data. It's like my data plot, but okay. So there it is. We see it's got this oscillating behavior that we expect for a mass on a spring. And now I would like to fit it to the equation for a mass on a spring. So I have a defined now, what have I run and not run? So I have not, I don't need to run this, but let me run this. I have the data. Let me run the plot again, shift, enter. Okay. And I am defining a function. So I have this uh, stroke here and I have four parameters and a variable. I have an equilibrium position, so it is not, the oscillation is not around some zero point. Um, so this is the, the middle of the oscillation. The It was a vertical uh, oscillation, so I called it Y and EQ for equilibrium. So that's the equilibrium position about which it oscillates. The A is the amplitude. It's how far the farthest points or how far we are from the equilibrium position. The capital T is the period, the amount of time it takes to sort of repeat itself. And phi is a phase constant, sort of what part of the cycle of cosine are we in? And then time is our variable. So, so time, time is the, the quantity then changes in this. And so then the function is defined as the equilibrium position plus the amplitude times the cosine function, capital C and square brackets, normal Mathematica stuff, two times pi, this is Mathematica's pi, capital P, but small i, times the variable little t divided by the period capital T plus a phase constant, close square bracket for the cosine. Okay, so that is a the function. Now we're going to try to fit the spring data to that function with noting that these are the parameters and this is the variable. And we get some answer, but it's not a very good answer. It, do, it doesn't give any indication that it didn't um, converge, which it will sometimes do. But if we just think about this, we can see that this is not a very good fit because we know what these parameters mean. The, the, the Y equilibrium should be like around seven, one, then it got, did get that right. But the amplitude is sort of how far we are from the equilibrium at the farthest point. And I'm, we're going from about 0.71 to about 0.73. So it should have been about 0.02. And we see here it's 0.0009. So it's not getting the amplitude right. It's not getting the period right. It's not getting the phase right. It's not getting any of these things right. And it's just um, when you're fitting data, you're often, um, you expect some scatter around your point. And so, all is really picking up is that there's some equilibrium position and this data scattered around it. So we need to uh, give it a hint, give it, put it in the right ballpark, and then it will do 
uh, we'll do the thinking and it will do the tedious uh, number grinding for us. Okay. So we do this fine fit again of the data to the function, but now we give it some quick starting points. So what are our starting points? So we said the middle, the equilibrium position was about seven to one. So that was our starting point for the y equilibrium, our amplitude, we went about two centimeters or 0.02 meters away on either side. So that was our amplitude. I did a quick period by saying, I'm sort of starting it near a max and I'm going to say one, two, three, four, five. Uh, five of them was about a little bit more than 1.5. So I'll make it easy. 1.5 divided by five is 0.3. So that was my sort of guess of a period to get me started. And I did start cosine uh, with no with a zero phase constant. Cosine starts um, near its maximum. And this is starting pretty close to its maximum. So I'll say for my guess for a phase constant is zero. So those are my guesses. And then and then it converges to, to reasonable stuff. And it's, it doesn't move too far um, from, from these initial values. And then I took those values and plotted our funks, plotted the function, the oscillation function in about the same range or domain of time. And I called it uh, my fit. And then, so now I have my data and my fit and we're putting them together. And we see that it is a pretty good fit, that, that that cosine function and the data agree. There are little, little spots here and there where we're off the curve a little bit, but for the most part, it seems to be uh, good. All right, um, now we're just gonna repeat with the second spring. So if you recall, this was column one, two, three, four, five. So the, the columns for the second spring are four or five. So we repeated what we had before. This was first index is sort of the sheet. And then this is the third column on, or sorry, the third row on, and we wanted the fourth and fifth column. So spring two is the data for the second spring. And there it is. Um, make a plot of it. So just make sort of same what we did before, make sure it's spring two, change the label to, to announce that this is the, uh, 450 gram mass. And so there is the data. Do the fit again. This time we see the equilibrium. I'm saying it's around six, nine. The uh, amplitude is still about two centimeters. The period, I'm saying uh, one, two, three, uh, four is about, I don't know, I'll say 1.6 very roughly, and then divide that by four. So point four so that's where this came from and again it's starting close to a maximum so i'm saying the phase is uh, zero to start off with and then it gives me these values and i'm going to plot that uh, function with those parameters and then combine it with combine the data for spring two and the fit for spring two. And we see that it is uh, pretty good. Okay, now we'll just do a little bit more playing around, getting comfortable with Mathematica. So it was the same spring and it was just a different amount of mass on the same spring. So we can get uh, a guess for the, what's called the spring constant. Um, so the, the, let's imagine that it wasn't oscillating, but then we just put it uh, on a mass on the spring slowly, then we would be at those equilibrium positions that we found the middle of those oscillations. And the change in the equilibrium position uh, multiplied by the spring constant K tells us the change in the spring force. And the change in the spring force has to balance the change in the weight, which is the change in the mass times the acceleration to gravity, 9.8. So I just did um, 
since I have Wolfram, let it do. There's a simple calculator thing I could do, but let let's let Mathematica do it. So I say solve the change in the mass, and I moved over to uh, kilograms here, because um, then um, I just um, I want to work with the sort of normal base units uh, that they use in general physics. So I switched over to this change in from 450, I made it 0. 0.450 kilograms minus 0. 0.25. That's the change in the mass. Multiply that by 9.81, the acceleration due to gravity. That's equal to K times the change in the spring constants. And I just, I want a positive K. So I'm, um, I'm just setting this up. So I'm going to get a positive K out of it. I don't want to go crazy on figuring out directions. So, and the minus signs in this case are just directions, and but the K is used typically taken to be a positive number. So I wanted a positive number, so I set it up to get a positive number. I'm getting about uh, 98. Okay. Then I want, so that I was using the equilibrium positions to get a K. So I had fit parameters were the equilibrium position and the amplitude and the period and the phase. And the theory says that, uh, that um, the equilibrium depends on um, how much mass, because the spring force has to balance the weight. The uh, amplitude is just sort of an accidental, like the person doing the experiment, how far did they pull it out of the equilibrium position? The period is supposed to depend on the mass and the spring constant. So that's what we're going to play with next. And the phase is again, more accidental of just sort of where did you start recording the data? What part of the cycle of the oscillating cycle were you in when you started to record data? Okay. So we're not really gonna be do anything with our amplitude. We're not gonna do anything with our phase, but let's play with the period. And theoretically the period's supposed to be two times pi times square root of mk. I just got a k by playing with our equilibrium. So let's try to uh, find the masses and see how they compare to the masses that uh, we sort of put in to the problem. Okay, so our first spring had a period of 0. 0.32105, and I'm setting that equal to two pi square root of a mass over K, which I just got to be 98, and solve that, and I get a mass of 0.256665. And if I do the same thing for the second spring, I get a mass of 0 0.459124. And so this is close to the 250, or um, again, I moved to kilograms, so 0 0.250. And this is the 0 0.450, so that is consistent. But I'm using a different fitting parameter here to point out uh, the period fitting parameter. Um, and to get the K, I used the equilibrium fitting parameter. So it is some test of sort of the consistency of the theory. And then the one thing that the theory assumes is that the spring is uh, massless, which of course it is not. Um, so one thing we can sort of imagine here or is that the difference between the mass we're finding in, in these solutions, and I'm sorry that I forgot to sort of run these, but I have run these previously, they're not going to give any different answer. Um, but we can say that the difference between uh, this, the, the 250 we, uh, we expect theoretically and this 0.256665, the that difference may be the contribution of the spring's mass to the like effective mass. So this, the entire spring doesn't move, but there are parts of the spring that move a lot and some of the parts of the spring that don't move much at all. So there's some fraction of the mass of the spring that contributes. And so we can say here that according to this result, there's about, I don't know, six grams of the mass of the spring or the, of the the spring is going to 
contributing about six grams to the effective mass, and down here maybe about nine grams. So, you know, who knows if my weights, how accurate they were, and so on. So this was not a a highly precise uh, experiment. So um, you have to take all this with a grain of salt. Okay. So that's what I wanted to show. Um, again, just more playing around with bringing data in from Excel, how to access it, the sort of sheet uh, row column, uh, how to get multiple rows and multiple columns with the semicolon, semicolon notation, um, and then uh, fitting it and just always making sure you as a as the as the user of of Mathematica of, of the find fit method, um, make sure you know what your parameters do, and if you're not getting a reasonable result, then try again with uh, some reasonable starting points, and you'll get better results. Okay, that's what I want to show you. Thank you much for your attention.